Good afternoon, everyone that's joining us online. Um, we're just going to wait another minute or two for some more people to jump on before we get started. John, we we might just go through the intros and then um, we should have the rest cool. on when we get started, I think. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm Naomi Hobson. I'm a livestock officer based out at Narrabri with Northwest Local Land Services. Um, we also have Sally Balmain on today. He's going to help run things um, just in case the internet decides to, to drop out on us today. Sal's here as our backup as well. So thank you for joining us for our webinar on understanding climate models. Um, so you're aware this is being um, recorded so that we can put the transcript out for everyone, but I can see all cameras are off and everyone's muted so there won't be any faces, but just so that you're aware. Before we start today, I'd like to acknowledge that we're dialing in from what was always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respects to the Gamilaroi people who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which I'm meeting today and also extend that to the traditional custodians you're all representing today as well as elders past, present and emerging. So our webinar today came from a conversation among our ag team and the fact that we would like to build our climate literacy to better oh, Looks like Naomi's frozen already. Um, but as she was saying, the um, webinar today has come about from a conversation we had in-house um, looking to better understand our climate literacy um, and the terminology and the tools that are used around forecasting. Um, and we also thought that there's probably some need for that in the wider community. So we've opened the webinar up to all the landholders who'd be interested as well. Um, and we brainstormed and came up with John, um, John Welsh from Ag Econ, who is with us today. John is the current Cotton Research Technical Lead for Climate Risk Management and publishes the industry e-news, Cotton Info Moisture Manager and things like that. He's a renowned communicator on helping agricultural users interpret and understand complex science, the cyclic nature of drivers influencing temperatures and rainfalls, particularly in our northern um, cropping and grazing areas um, in New South Wales and Queensland. John is a routine fixture in speaking agendas at local agronomy group gatherings, corporate farms, board meetings and industry conferences, um, and including previous dual international presentations in climate science. John's recently published um, research article on climate impacts on the Australian cotton yields, um, and it's a top ranking peer reviewed journal, um, which remains as a career highlight for John. Uh, he lives on a sheep and cattle farm in northern New South Wales. Um, so before I hand over to John, um, any questions you have throughout John's presentation, um, please type them in the chat bar and we'll go all through them uh, at the end. Um, and any um, links and things that John mentions, we will email those out to you. So um, if you find yourself short of a pen frantically, don't worry, we'll send you all of the, the relevant stuff at the end. Uh, so I'll mute myself and hand over to John. Thanks, Sally, and thanks to the LLS for inviting me on today. Understanding climate, this is, um, has been a passion of mine to understand the science, um, having been a landholder myself and being in the position where we are now, I think, um, not too proud to say, it was 1997 when we had a an Eastern Pacific El Nino, exactly the same as 2023, and um, it was a record strength El Nino, uh, not unlike this year, and it rained. So I was very, very confused as to why that happened. I think we've sold off a heap of stock, um, and then that, that commenced the journey into understanding how, how we make better decisions from what available information we've got ahead of us. So um, hopefully when we leave today, there'll be a few key things that will come out of that. And, and, and one of those is a way to assess the myriad of information available on the internet um, and, inf and, and to house and to, to bookmark climate information sources. Have a look at the big picture cycles and the annual cycles and, and even the smaller seasonal cycles as well and just come up with a, a game plan when we need to make key decisions, whether that be selling stock, buying fodder, um, planting crops, et cetera. Um, 
at, at those decision points, come up with some sort of a framework to work our way through the, the different information sources. So we're going to start uh, the presentation just having it exploring the climate cycles and you know not farming to the average. The average hardly ever occurs. It's normally too wet or too dry and hardly ever in between. We, you know, we hardly ever get that Goldilocks season where we get our average rainfall. Um, you know, in any given month, it seems to be one way or the other. Um, and, and come up with a systems approach to looking at risk and evaluating this information. And making sure that we're looking at quality information, you know, the, the rise of Facebook and social media, there's a lot of um, experts and a lot of very clever market marketing um, Facebook is out there that have subscription services. And we want to try and make sure that we stick to really good quality information to avoid tripping ourselves up and, and getting misled to some degree. And then last of all, have a, let's have a look at some decision support for farming and um, links will be provided to those registered on the on the webinar and we will circulate those. So you don't have to scribble for a pen or type anything in as we go, we will circulate those at the end. Yeah, so farming, farming is not unlike, um, you know, the gambler Kenny Rogers famous song, knowing when to hold them and when to fold them. And, and that certainly is exactly what we do in, in ag and farming. Do we sell cattle now? Do we plant that crop? Do we buy fodder at five or six hundred, seven hundred dollars a ton and then see it rain the next week? How do we evaluate these decisions? And um, just to have a look at the, the big picture, um, I'll take you off to another tab in a second. But if we have a look now at this screen, we'll see here that female cattle slaughter ratio, that's basically how many cows go through the system versus how many are retained for breeding. And, and you can see here that the, the really wet years of through here, 97, 98, up to 2000, and there was a shocker in 2002, we had a high female cattle slaughter ratio. And you'll see here the peaks are generally those drier periods where we run out of grass and a lot more cows are killed. Um, and if you're going to trade cattle, you would certainly do it, you know, when, when you knew that cycle was going to break into, into one of these wetter cycles here where there's more grass and, and less cattle getting killed. 2007, 2008 were La Nina years, or, or at least 2008 was. And, and then again, 2009 was a really dry year, and then 2012 was a wet year. Like there was a string of uh, almost triple La Ninas, 2010, 11, and 12 was an almost La Nina. There was a very reduced female cow, cow kill in that year. And similarly, um, 2019 was obviously the landmark horrific drought year and then coming now into these years here. So, so this is all cycle based and you have another look here at the New South Wales sorghum production and yield. The, the blue circles here, again, areas of high production for sorghum occurring in, in La Nina years. And these red circles here just show, you know, those really tough um, years where we've had El Ninos and of course 2019 and 1994 were, were landmark years. Obviously the the volume's going to also depend on the price at the time and the substitute in and out for cotton for summer crops. But, but nonetheless, um, another cycle there. And if we, look, if we look now at the cotton, the percentage of dryland cotton, and I've got the bars shaded here to, to El Nino and La Nina and neutral, where the grey bars are neutral. And you'll see there the percentage of dryland um, cotton produced um, when compared to irrigated does seem to be very much aligned with those wetter years as, you, as you'd expect. Um, but, but before I go off the bigger picture cycles, what you're seeing here is time series of 20 to 30 years um, in each of these three charts. Now, if we, if we just take a look at the Department of Industry and Science in, in Queensland have come up with a, a really interesting set of maps. And for those of you that have been in farming for a while, this will certainly resonate with you guys um, as to how we can see clusters of years. We all know that El Nino, La Nina or neutral can occur on annual timescales, so each year. But there is another bigger picture driver sitting in behind that called the, called the IPO, which is the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation or another word the Americans call Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So that occurs on, on five to seven year timescales. And you look at our rainfall, this is really indicative as a way to measure this in the oceans. 
But if you look at these clusters of years that the Department of Science have put together in Brisbane, you see these years seem to rotate and oscillate and seesaw between wet and dry um, in, in these years. So, you know, I say farming to the cycles. You can imagine taking on a, a five-year lease block um, and, and living in the northern tablelands here and going into a horrific series of droughts and having to pay lease costs, for example. Or if you did it in, in uh, 1996, and, you know, you would have had a dream run of um, five or six years to, to pay your lease fees and, and to do some farming and make some money. And then, and then we've got this other set of years here, 2001 to 2007, not many summer cropping opportunities. A lot of people are back to just looking at winter crops and chickpeas, uh, wheat and chickpeas in those ro years' rotations. 2007 to 12, well, obviously we had those almost triple La Nina from 10 to 12 in those years. Um, and then this is the, the, the one that springs to mind for sure for most of us, that horrific run of really hot and dry record-breaking years um, ending in 2019. And the interesting thing for, for, for those of you on this webinar now is let's, for goodness, hope that we're in a, a five to seven year weather cycle. And we'll have a bit of a um, stargaze in a moment as to what 24, 2024 could, could hold for us. Um, but, but going on the trends, trend analysis of the IPO, of which there is a way to measure it, mind you, there's an index. And that's still very much in wetter phase at the moment. Um, and that's the, the last three years, basically, um, which is fascinating to know what's going on, you know, as a context um, at the moment. So just moving on to the to the next slide. So so I guess with the the five to seven year um, cycle, the wet to dry phase cycle in mind, it's really good to to understand. I think to, to evaluate risk, we need to be mindful and acutely aware there are these wet phase and dry phase cycles that exist on those you know multi year scales and then the annual scale. So. El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is both the phenomenon, which is El Nino, La Nina, and neutral. And then you've got the IOD, which is another acronym. The, um, the climate space is full of acronyms. So the Indian Ocean Dipole, that's the same wet and dry phase cycle that occurs in the Indian Ocean. It's got a really short life cycle that comes and goes between May and October. Uh, that was in dry phase this year. And then you've got the, the seasonal um, outputs as well, which is seasonal is the three monthly outlook um, and, and that three monthly, you know, one season ahead. Um, and then we've got our weather, which is our smaller, shorter cycles as well to consider. So at the moment, our IPO is in wetter phase and our ENSO cycles and IOD are in dry phase and our, our neutral, our seasonal forecast is kind of sitting on the fence. But when our worst droughts occur, all of these different timescales align with dry and the, the really wet year like 2022 all of these different timescales aligned as wet so you don't really have to be a rocket scientist to pick those years when you when you're in this game um, looking at this information all the time like I am they're really quite easy to to pick you know the the weather events come through on seven to ten day cycles and it rains routinely the models are pretty accurate but in a year like 2023 we had a wet phase background, we had a dry phase annual, and we had, you know, um, neutral. We had we had seasonal models not giving us much, and it was it made forecasting pretty tricky. So when they all align, it's much easier. And when they're scattered like it is this year, um, we have to dig a little deeper. <clears throat> so when we're looking at these models, we've got um, among in between the seasonal three monthly models and the weather. We've got a, a new, um, a whole new set of models called the sub-seasonal or multi-week models. Now, these ones um, I find probably the most valuable by a fair way, simply because when you're looking at grain markets and livestock markets, all the traders, albeit grain traders and, and, and meat processors, are looking at the weather forecasts, so the 0 to 8 days, they're looking at the, the bureaus, water in the land, or you know, they're looking at GFS and they're looking at the colours update at five five o'clock and five o'clock in the morning every day. Whereas the sub-seasonal forecast, which I'm going to enlighten you of, of two of the models that we use, I mean, they're far better to give us a guide to, th of, you know, 
two to three to four weeks ahead when these systems could be occurring. So if you have to ring a farming contractor, um, you know, you can do that with a little bit of notice. You know, if you ring the farming contractor four days out to come and spray your paddock, he's already had six phone calls by the time you call. And similarly with the grain traders, you're, you're looking at, you know, and, and, and livestock, you're looking at selling ahead on a forward market. Most of the, the trading um, commerce in ag are looking at the weather forecast rather than the, the sub-seasonal mid, middle um, multi-week forecast. So we're going to have a look at that. But as you can tell, I, I, I find a touch of irony in the weather forecast model here, the blue um, forecast skill on this left-hand side you see here, you know, 20 days out, um, not much accuracy and getting better. Um, but here we've got the blue dot sitting at day zero and the forecast skill is excellent when the, the water's running down the gutters. So that's uh, not that much use. But the seasonal forecast as well. And what's surprising is the seasonal forecast here being quite good skill when compared to the, you know, to the weather models and to the sub-seasonal models. So that does vary depending on um, what's going on in the background and how these different time scales are aligned. But the seasonal forecast is certainly um, something that, you know, very much we should look at all in tandem. When we're looking at the summer season, um, very much alike the Red Bull cliff diver here, jumping off and doing somersaults in front of an enormous crowd there. Um, the models, you know, the monsoon, the summer season is so much more dynamic. Air, air pressure and, and, and oceans move so much quicker. Um, a cyclone, when atmospheric and, and ocean conditions align, can develop in four days um, and anywhere in that northern tropics and change everything. It can suck the moisture out of the mid-latitudes where we are here in northern New South Wales. Um, so a lot can change. So, you know, we, we really have to survey widely when we're trying to evaluate risk in our summer cropping season um, just because things are so dynamic. Whereas the winter and spring, and to a lesser extent autumn, winter and spring are, are more stable in terms of, of looking for a signal as to lean which way or the other. So what's driving our, well, not only our summer climate, summer's an example I'll use here, but what, what this is here is, um, is kind of knowing, you know, which phenomenon, is it the Indian Ocean or is it the Pacific Ocean or is it atmospheric? What's driving our climate? And I just thought I'd pluck this bit of research out of um, CSIRO and, and you can see there um, New South Wales and there's a whole bunch of colours. We've got the Nino, um, El Nino Southern Oscillation Ocean Temperature here in green. You've got um, El Nino Madoki, which is a, a, a quite a confusing acronym. That's, again, um, measuring zones in the Pacific Ocean. Then you've got the IOD, which stands for Indian Ocean Dipole. And this th this fourth one here is a southern annular mode, which is a um, an atmospheric driver, um, which measures, you know, the trade, well, basically the winds that circulate around Antarctica and blow moisture up into, into our area. So... What we've got here is a revolving three-month window where my mouse cursor is there, July, August, September. What you'll see here is that northern New South Wales is kind of a hybrid mix between the SAM and um, the, the Pacific Ocean. So the major drivers here are the ones coloured. Um, so, so I guess the take-home here is to show that we hear lots of commentary about the Indian Ocean Dipole, but it's very much affecting Victoria, western New South Wales and South Australia. Um, we we do we are very much um, our leading mode of variability is more so this El Nino Madoki, which is um, which we certainly report on in the cotton industry e news that we do routinely to better understand that. We've made a, a, a mini YouTube on how to how to interpret that, whatever else. So, but what 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 I wanted to show you here is that the white colours mean that there's no significance. So what the researchers have done here is gone all right. Let's see um, how each one of these drivers impacts the rainfall. And when there's no colours, it means they're not significant. We've come down to November, December, January, December, January, February here on this bottom right hand, and there's no significance. Or, or there might be a dot here or there up around the border there, um, near Gunda Windy. But what that's showing is we're very reliant upon storm rain and, you know, there there isn't um, a whole lot of guidance in terms of of looking for the climate for answers for our summer season because we just get random rainfall events through storms in summer 
and we don't have the best connection with understanding the climate. Um, and this next um, page here just shows the strength of those correlations. Yeah, so so the summer season is is inherently hard to predict, and you know researchers know that, but there are ways and means around that which will cover off. So as we sort of launch into um, having a look at information sources, and uh, I can't believe there's only 10 minutes to go, but um, we, we want to make sure that we we stay really disciplined with our information sources and, and, and look correctly at, at the, the highest performing models so that we're getting the best information that, that is out there. Um, and, you know, getting misled or, or, or using um, less than ideal information can certainly have flow on effects to, to your business. Um, you know, if, if you're not aware that it's it's not perfect. So I guess what we've done in the cotton industry is to make sure that we've set up a bit of a, a climate best management practice to, to try and steer growers towards the, the best information all around the globe, not just the, the Bureau, just looking at the above and below median in the bureaus. Um, so, yeah, not unlike the SAS radio man here, um, you know, we certainly need to make sure that we, we're looking at the best possible information and that's filtering down and and actioning into your business. And in doing so, coming up with a game plan. Do we have a game plan? And a lot of people, the answer is no, because where do you find this information? I mean, it's not taught in schools. Universities do a tiny little bit in some certain ag sectors. And, you know, ironically, you know, Asian nations and other more populous nations have this as part of their syllabus. But yet in Australia, where we've got the most variable climate in the world, we still don't really have um, a framework to look at and to assess information. So what I'm suggesting here is um, is to have a look at these few sources on a daily level. There's, there's a couple of sources that we'll, we'll look at. And then weekly as well, I'll share those multi-week models with you that are updated once a week. And then monthly, how we pull all these, the, the seasonal models together um, and assess them. So the daily information sources with, with two simple stops, um, if you Google Meteologics, and I'll circulate this link later, that will give you a distribution of eight global models for rainfall um, in any given day. So where we see a wide scatter here, um, you can see the distribution just shows, you know, more uncertainty. Whereas when you've got a cluster of all eight models showing 30 or 40 mils, you can take higher confidence in, in a rain event. But the only one not included in there, and that's the private um, IBM weather model that you can find on your iPhone, that's again separate. But I believe that's the best place um, to look at you know, what's going on. So in basically one minute, you can access nine of the top international um, weather models. And I'll just jump out of that tab and just show you the, um, the Windy. This is a terrific app simply because you can go in and have a look at the ECMWF, which is the European model um, for your location. I've got here where um, where Sally is there at Warri Alda. Um, and if you click on that, right click on that location, show weather picker, um, and that will give you a, that. I'll just click out of that bottom bit there. So you can t scroll through your tabs here. This is the GFS US model showing 13 mils, and then you've got the access model showing 68 mils. So again, you've got a, a nice geographic visual um, assessment of where that rain's going to fall, which is, this is a terrific tool. So you've got a rebadged um, radar and satellite there, which just takes the API feed from the Bureau and just jazzes it up a, a bit with some nice colors um, and, and lightning, et cetera. So, and this is free or you can go the premium option. But again, um, yeah, if, if you wanted to assess those three models, uh, that's another additional way um, other than the meteorologics. So just conscious of running out of a bit of time here. Whoops, where are we going? Backwards. The multi-week models. Now this is hopefully those of you that weren't aware that, that these models existed. Um, having a look at, you know, that 10 to 30 day time scale when you can look a little bit further out and, and kind of get ahead of the pack with, with rain. Certainly the, the IRI US model there on the left um, did pick up the, the November wet signal, very much so. It's a very, very conservative model, doesn't show rain very often. Um, and then we've got the, the Bureau scenario. If you, if you go into the climate tab there, it'll give you a 75% chance of. 
um, and then your mills on the on the key here on the right hand side. And again, that will go out multi week. So here we are on the 12th. That's shown from the 16th to the 29th. And again, you can click through to the next um, series of, of of seven to ten days. So they're the, the two best free available ones, um, and they're really really valuable. I find when when you when you see a signal and they become aligned, you know you can you can start preparing, you can start making those phone calls, or you know if you're at the crunch point like we were here, where you had to step into the fodder market or sell some stock, um, you can just hang on that extra week or two um, and wait and see what these rain events. Um, happen. I know one of my neighbours here sold uh, a lot of stock and then it rained and another one bought um, three B doubles of hay from the south and, and and he reckons he made it rain by by doing that. Um, but but yeah, so and then on to the season, seasonal model summary here. This is a free service that the cotton industry give to its growers. You don't have to be a cotton grower to subscribe. There's a monthly e-news that comes out and what I put together here is just a, a summary and we're Northern New South Wales in this column here, and assess six of the um, the leading research agencies to see where we sit, whether it's a wetter or a drier tone for the next three months. And that's all summarised as is, you know, the current status of all our drivers. So that's all done for you um, if you subscribe to that e-news service there. And we intensify that, goes out every fortnight during March and April when winter crops are planted and goes out every fortnight in summer crop. We've just come through October, November, where we put that issue, that update every um, every fortnight just to keep um, constituents in the loop there of changes. Cropping decision support, here's another really free one. Look, there are subscription service you can sign sign up for, and you know if you can be bothered to go through the admin, you can you know, pay fees for this sort of thing. But this one, um, at the start of your winter crop or summer crop planting, you can go into ARM online and there's, there is a um, quite a detailed functional tool there for um, assessing what yield outputs you might get under a bunch of starting soil conditions and, and, and seasonal conditions for, for your crop, um, whether it be chickpeas, wheat, um, beans, etc. So that's a, another really good one to look at that has climate um, parameters in there that you can set um, for your own budgeting and your um, your input uh, purposes. Livestock decision, there is Ask Bill. This is put together by some researchers at UNE. And again, this has got functionality with, um, you know, measuring for fly and worm pressure in your in your flocks um, and has a climate parameter in there as well um, and some warning you can set. That is a, a free for, well, free for students, but um, that is a subscription service there as well. Climate Kelpie, uh, I had a look at this and, and we we're involved in contributing to this in the cotton industry. Um, they house, they've done a lot of work in housing, all the decision support. That um, website seems to be down at the moment, but there is a Facebook page um, alive. There's lots of really good information there and educational and research information on all these bunch of farming decision tools that you can have a look at. A couple of experts to, that are good to follow. Uh, for climate news, Ben Domencino, the, the the meteorologist at Weather Zone, he does some really neat. He presents some really neat charts and figures um, as to you know what's impacting the Australian continent in terms of climate and air pressure anomalies and all sorts of things and and storms as well. Um, as is Jason Nichols, who who concentrates more on on climate. So he, his long range predictions are. Um, and ENSO sequencing and Indian Ocean dipole stuff's incredible. He's a terrific one to follow uh, once you get your literacy um, to a point where you can understand, you know, those longer lead times and all the jargon and terminology that goes with it. I just thought I'd throw this slide in because every news article you pick up now seems to have a, an AI component in that's, you know, coming to um, write emails for you and to basically tell you how to live your life. Um, so I just thought I'd throw in, we, we, we have tended to rely in the weather space on um, general circulation models, which which require massive computing power. The biggest computer in the world was actually a climate model um, years ago until the military superseded that. But um, artificial intelligence has been attempted um, in, in, in ocean prediction and kind of not done so well. Um, the European Centre for for um, medium range weather forecasting has just come up with this trial product 
um, and I'll circulate that in the links as well. And there's a, a 10 day model here using AI that's in its experimental phase that you can access at the moment. And that's just showing Monday the 18th and showing some rain for us. So let's hope that's that's the case because it's dried out really quickly. So just wrapping up and it's just hit one o'clock. Um, so it's uh, I think it's it's um, encouraged growers to be you know really acutely aware of the many wet and dry cycles um, that that occur on different time scales, not just the annual ones. Um, so so I, I guess with the El Nino La Nina, uh, the research has shown that you know when you've got a background wet context, your El Ninos tend to be more like Labradors than Dobermans. And similarly with your El Ninos, when you've got a um, or sorry, your La Ninas, when you've got a, a really dry background um, multi-year phase, your La Ninas will be, you know, pop guns. And we saw that in 2018. I remember distinctly um, when I was living at Narrabri, the, the Bureau, you know, putting the flag up and saying, all right, we, December 2018, we, we're in a La Nina, um, and then it didn't rain again the rest of the summer. Uh, and looking back on that, you know, we, we're in a dry phase. Um, background context and that La Nina never really bared fruit simply because we had too many competing uh, wet and dry cycles on that time scale. So setting up information systems and I've come come forward with a suggestion here and, and certainly um, um, you know that's just as a guide just from basically experience and knowing where to find these models that are doing really well and um, trying to direct towards a systems approach and acknowledging you know what good habits to get into and, and particularly incorporating those multi-week models into and the seasonal predictions that, that are updated monthly um, into your risk management and into coming into you know becoming good habits um, and, and choosing w which information sources to look at and certainly you know unlike me and and I certainly was where a lot of you may well be now and that's all I basically knew was that El Nino means dry and La Nina means wet, but but um, you know uh, how muddy and how grey, you know that's certainly um, not as black and white as as knowing you know those two things when you consider all these other factors. So take the time and certainly try and educate yourself. And, and you know um, the harder you do work at it, the luckier you will get. So. Um, but certainly keen to take some questions, Sally and Naomi, if um, if you do have some. Sorry for running a little bit over time. That's fine, John. Thank you. Um, I I certainly found that really interesting about the four phases of assessing risk and how looking at how those interact together um, for a longer term prediction. I found that really interesting. Um, we'll just check in the chat box now. Um, I see Sal's pop something in there. If you do have any questions, please put them in the chat for us to ask John. Um, one that I had is what is, I guess the big question for everyone will be what are you seeing for 2024 for us moving forward? Yeah, I suppose. You, um, thanks, Naomi. When you drill down into the technical detail, there, there is some supportive factors to suggest that when we have a dry phase Indian Ocean and an eastern Pacific El Nino, so that's a really hot um ocean temperatures in the eastern pacific rather than the central areas that can flip into a la nina the following year um, and that did happen in um 1997 into 98 and there was a weak la nina from 2015 into 2016 which was a very wet indian ocean dipole year so there are um, model predictions already showing a la nina signal for for the second half of 2024 and that, I guess, falls into line with the, the wetter background conditions that we're in, um, to, to, you know, depicted by that IPO phase. So um, if we're looking at this, these maps here, which are just so fascinating to me, you know, let's hope that we are in, um, you know, a, a five to seven year or even longer wetter phase where, um, you know, the, the, the La Ninas tend to clock up and and, and, and I guess it's, Important to note also, there's there's a 50% probability, more probability that we'll get a back-to-back -back La Nina. Um, so El Ninos tend to go not back-to-back, -back, but La Ninas do. Um, so if there's one on the horizon for 2024, let's hope that you know we can get a, a pair of them um, and and lead to more rain. So 
Yeah, things are looking pretty good, Naomi, on, on, on 2024 at this stage, um, although it is early days from those drivers resetting. They tend to reset January, February, and then make their mind up. And and at the moment, the trajectory is showing that, you know, La Nina is certainly in, in, the, in the calculations for 2024. Yeah, thank you, John. Let's hope it, it leads it leads that way. And now we've all got some tools to use to help track that. Um, another question, um, I can see there's a few people just trying to type in their questions, but one I'll throw out. Um, should we, we be watching for monsoon activity and cyclones as a guide to rainfall over the summer period? <laughs> to an extent, I, I guess yes and no. We always, that's, that's where the bulk of our moisture does come from, from, you know, the Coral Sea and warm waters around the Arafura and the, uh, you know, and, and Java through the northwest shelf. That, stream, that tends to stream down into the mid latitudes where we live. But cyclones are funny things. Um, most, you know, some people go, oh, yeah, there's a cyclone forming off Port Hedland or in the Coral Sea. That's terrific. But sometimes they can also suck a lot of moisture out of the mid latitudes and and we can go through a dry uh, period while those cyclones are forming. And then we just hope to gosh that uh, when they decay, that we get a rain depression like Cyclone Debbie did come down over us years ago and, and, and wet us all. Um, so the tropics, you know, we do like to see them alive, but I, I guess it's probably more important to watch the, the and, and this may be used to some people aren't aware of the Madden Julian Oscillation, which is that monsoonal driver of, of, of moist air that rotates around the earth. And cyclones tend to to develop, um, you know, upon the passing of that MJO phase. So, yeah, the, the summer season, is, it's very dynamic now. I mean, it's pretty hard to tease anything out of, of too much activity in the tropics. Yeah, thank you, John. We've had a question pop up in our chat from Francis. Is there any correlation to whether we sunspot activity as espoused by some? Notice none of the indicators appear to be based on that activity. Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, in in uh, dealing with cotton growers, we've had lots of advisors and and the Crop Consultants Australia actually commissioned me to do a study on sunspots and whether or not uh, that was in 2019 when we we're in the depths of the drought. Whether we should be looking at sunspots as a guide to picking up some sort of um, signals for when it could rain again. And um, during that research to to identify whether there was any relevance, I found in by the, by the time 1980 came around, there was over a thousand peer-reviewed journal articles on sunspots, and the researcher from the CSIRO, um, from CSIRO, came up after reviewing these all this information that um, there were there was you know a tiny but weak connection with sunspots, but not really enough there, um, you know, to, to to base decisions off. I know there's. Uh, a few social media guys right into the sunspots and they've got a really intense following. So, but in terms of checking out with the, the scientific community, I, I, I think that, you know, there, there is a relationship with the what's called a, a quasi biennial oscillation, which is, um, you know, the movement of, of the um, winds and moisture in the jet stream with sunspots. And that's captured in the general circulation model. So pulling that out and having a look at that, sunspot activity activity on its own is probably not going to give you the value that you would expect um you know as opposed to a, a computer model map yeah thank you john that's a really in intriguing question and answer um i can see there's one more question getting typed in at the moment so we'll give a minute for it to come through um sal did you have any questions on the back um I guess also as we come into um, summer, John, particularly um, with regards to our livestock, like high temperatures um, and that sort of heat wave prediction mm. stuff, is there somewhere good to to keep a track on that? There absolutely is, and I probably should have embedded that in the in the presentation. Um, heat wave, there is a really good heat wave model, but it doesn't go out very far. Um, Heat wave. Um, well, uh, oh goodness, now yeah, I can't find it. Um, there is a heat wave model prediction in. If I can just find the maps, I can't find it in front of me now. 
um, yeah, there certainly is on the Bureau, but there's that much information here. I just don't have it at my fingertips. But, but yeah, certainly that, that, that's been one um, one thing I've noticed and it's been the biggest challenge with, for me for, for run, running our family business. I mean, we've had 34 inches here for the calendar year and, and it's been a tough year because um, we've just needed so much rain to, to, to keep the soil wet because it's the, the intense periods of heat really do dry things out so fast. Um, that we have to make sure we have good ground cover and not too many stock on because um, the heat has been the biggest challenge. But but certainly, yeah, the, the, the heat wave um, model is is here it, and I will circulate that. Uh, and we do also report on that in the Cotton Industries e-news every fortnight or month. So for those of you that want to sign up to that, um, which is a free service, um, we, will, we do publish the, the results of the heat wave model in that. So sorry, Sally, I can't lay my hands on that um, on that driver um, while we speak. No, that's all right. We'll add that yeah. into the link that we um, we send around. John might be a good idea. Yeah, I will. And, and here it is. Here, I just had a space between heat and wave, but but yeah. So that is a um, that is a prediction here that that does go out. I think you know five days ahead. So it's a really good one for irrigators. If there's any irrigators here that, you know, you can see there's heat waves coming, you can pump more water into storage or or prepare yourself for long pump running times. And Or if you own a cattle feed lot to, you know, have a cooler ration um, mix for those those really hot times. So, yeah, the heat's becoming a, a tricky one to manage, Sally, and I don't know that, you know, um, you know everyone concentrates on rainfall, but but adapting to the heat is one of the biggest challenges I think a lot of the, the farming producers have to manage in terms of fallow moisture disappearing from farmland and managing your ground cover when you're a grazier, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you, John. And um, Ali's actually just popped that in the chat as well, a link if anyone wants to copy it and have a look now while I wait for the links. Um, we have one more question from Pamela, which is probably a perfect one to finish up on. Could you share any resources or links to sources to improve one's climate literacy? Training and or quick reading um, would both be welcome. Yeah, I certainly can. Um, I think the cotton industry would love to come up with a kind of a best management practice, which they're famous for having all these BMPs for for everything, for, for chemical storage to whatever. But we don't have one for climate risk and extension. But um, I do... A lecture for U and E every year, and we've got a I've got a 101 syllabus um, that that certainly I can share just just as a bit of a guide with the foundational research into what the impacts of the Indian Ocean are, for example. And there's some really good animations as well that um, Victorian DPI put together for for what each driver does and 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 how to get your head around um, the concepts. So yeah, certainly I can share those with you. Um, and a few good YouTubes we we managed to whip up for the cotton industry as well. So, yeah, there's, there's certainly at least half an hour of of you know hopefully some valuable YouTubes and and um, and you know some kind of uh, entry level academic syllabus on climate risk for sure we can help you with. Yeah, thank you, John and um, Pamela. Has said that sounds fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've had another question come in. Is there anywhere we can check the loss of water through evaporation? Yeah, so evaporation, there there are two measurements. One is pan evaporation, which just comes from, um, you know, that, that raw measurement of how much water you would lose from a pan. And the other one is, is ETO, um, which measures the loss um, of, of water or, or moisture into the atmosphere from the whole basket of criteria from from um, wind, um, dew point and humidity, um, temperature um, and solar radiance. So ETO is probably a much better way to um, to assess moisture loss and the Bureau does have, but you have to dig again, um, you have to dig. There are actually, there's tabled measurements of ETO that you can find quite easily on the Bureau's website. But they actually, on on, a, on the Australian Water Outlook, they do have a predictive model for um, predicting um, evaporative loss through ETO. The irrigators are right into this this space. Um, 
yeah, so there are two, definitely two tools I can I can certainly help you with, direct you towards evaporative loss. That'd be good, thank you. And um, we've also, Francis has just popped in a link to the seasonal conditions information portal, which is on the New South Wales DPI. Um, so that has some good resources as well. And that's actually what we utilise to feed into our modelling as well internally um, to help us plan what activities we need to do for extension. Uh, we just have a comment there from Ali, such a useful presentation. Thanks so much. Um, that's really good to hear. And I can see there's one more question just being typed. So I'll just give that a second to come through. Um, and we might wrap up if no one else has any more questions. No, it looks like that one's disappeared. Um, so that's all we've got for now. Thank you very much for your time, John. Um, I've certainly found it really useful. It looks like the people on have as well. In terms of recording, we'll have that coming out in the coming weeks, um, most likely on our YouTube channel, but we'll let you know. And we'll also send out the, um, the web links as well so you can look into all those tools that John has put forward for us. So that's cool. Oh, there we go. Another comment. Thank you. Most useful. Um, that's really good. Um, great presentation. Very useful. Thank you for the invite from Janelle. So I think we'll wrap up there. Um, we've stuck fairly closely to our time. So thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for jumping on today. Um, I hope you have a good afternoon. Thanks, Naomi and Sally, and, um, yeah, wishing everyone a great Christmas and a wet one. Hopefully there is a system coming through for Christmas and, and soon after that. So let's hope it stays there and cools us down um, and we can certainly enjoy a stormy, wet summer. Um, and thanks again for the invite, Naomi and Sally. Absolutely. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye. Bye.